The Start to Finish Reloading Series is brought to you by EP Integrations, home of the EP 2.0 Brass Annealer. They can anneal from 300 blackout to 50 BMG and everything in between without having to add or remove any parts and can adjust in less than 30 seconds from cartridge to cartridge. Also the home of the EP Integrations Lockdown Reloading Block, the last reloading tray you will ever need. And it's fully adjustable, just under 223 and just over 375 shy tack And it can adjust in less than one second. For further information, check out the description box below for www.epintegrations.com. Enough said, let's get this going. Now, before we start, there's a few things I need to get out of the way. First and foremost, obviously when it comes to reloading, there's a certain level of risk when it comes to reloading. I'm not teaching you how you should reload i'm teaching you how i reload so keep that in the back of your mind also if you're new to the game or even if you've been reloaded for some time you really need to watch every single second of this video series if you're skipping forward and backwards or completely missing parts of this series you're truly not going to want to learn so you might have to watch this video series numerous times to truly grasp that knowledge and finally is, is just trying to learn your own reloading journey. Take what you learn here, watch some other YouTube channels, get those reloading manuals, maybe even check out some forums such as Sniper's Hide and gather all the information and develop your own journey. I can't stress that enough. It really is about developing your own journey and it depends on your purpose. You know, obviously you're gonna to have to do different reloading techniques, maybe even low development. If you're doing something really high end, such as F class shooting or PRS shooting, or if you're just a weekend warrior like myself, it's really all about finding your own journey. Now in this series, I'm reloading for my 20 inch varmint bull barrel that has a wild chamber. It's fantastic for shooting factory ammunition, in both 223 and 556. But when it comes to the reloading world, I could really care less. Once that brass is fire formed, once you pull that trigger and that powder ignites, that brass expands and fire forms to that particular chamber, I could really care less. And this reloading series truly is for both bolt action and semi-automatic, with the only difference of bumping back that headspace a little bit different between a bolt action and semi-automatic, which I'm about to go over that in future parts of the series. So keep that in mind. It really doesn't matter if it's semi-automatic or bolt action. At least for me, when it comes to fire form brass, I usually bump that brass back roughly three to four thousandths of an inch for a semi-automatic and roughly two thousandths of an inch for a bolt action. And that's really the only difference. So if you're concerned between a bolt action and a semi-automatic, it's really, really no different. Also, it doesn't really matter if we're talking about 223, 556, 308, 338 Lapua. This really is all the same. It doesn't matter. It's pretty much the same reloading processes. Now, if you're absolutely new to the game, it really all depends on where you're starting out with your brass. You're starting out with something like this brand spanking new Starline 6.5 Creedmoor brass. Usually the headspace on this is you're usually set somewhere as close to something like factory ammunition. More times than not, depending if it's a semi-automatic or bolt action, you're going to want to fire form that brass and bump it back a particular amount. Usually three to four thousandths of an inch for a semi-automatic or two thousandths of an inch for a bolt action. But like I said, with brand new brass, usually the headspace is very similar to something like factory ammo. But I always recommend resizing brand new brass for one particular reason, and that is neck tension. Also, these case mouth openings have a tendency to be dented. If there's the slightest dent in that case mouth opening and you go to seat that new bullet, usually it will shave off the copper jacket of that bullet. So not only do you resize that brand new brass to get a concentric case mouth opening, but also for a consistent neck tension. It's really important. Now in this example, I'm going to be resizing some Lake City once fired brass that I got off a of gentleman on Facebook. No joke, I got well over a thousand pieces for about $60. Now keep in mind, this was not fired out of my firearm. This is most likely fired out of a military grade firearm that has a very generous headspace. I'm going to have to bump back that headspace a particular amount, usually an excessive amount of bumping back that uh, headspace with a full length resizing die. 
<clears throat> and you're going to see that here in the future parts of the series. Um, but when it comes to this once fired Lake City brass, I'm going to have to make sure I call out the bad pieces and decap out these spent primers. So regardless, if it's once fired brass that you purchase or maybe some range pick brass, it's really important to make sure you call out those bad pieces and decap those spent primers as your first step of the reloading process. Next is figuring out an organization method to your brass. You know, I got my brand new 6.5 Grendel here in the front, brand new 6.5 Creedmoor here in the back with Starline. Obviously, we just talked about this once fired Lake City brass here. And also, I got some bulk boxes over here of Lake City 556. So once fired 243 for hunting purposes. And over here, I have some big pullout trays for 556 223 miscellaneous brass, 65 Creedmoor, 45 ACP, 40 Smith and Wesson, 7.62 by 51 or 308, and 9 millimeter brass. But just figuring out a method for storing and organizing your brass. Now, when it comes to bottleneck rifle cartridges, not so much straight wall pistol casings, but bottleneck rifle cartridges. When I say bottleneck, just like a Coke bottle, usually you're not gonna get as many fires on that brass in comparison to something like a straight wall pistol cartridges. Straight wall pistol cartridges usually can get well over of excess of 20, 30 firings on that straight wall pistol cartridges for progressive reloading for something like a pistol. But when it comes to rifles and bottleneck uh, casings, I can't stress the importance of keeping track of the amount of fires on that brass. And for example, this has one fire on it. Some of these say, you know, two fires, three fires. Some are clear up to six fires on this 5.56 five, brass. And I'm keeping track of that for a specific reason. Usually in a semi-automatic, you know, for example, like a 5.56, five, you might only get maybe five, six reloads out of that bottleneck rifle cartridge out of a semi-automatic. If it's a bolt action, you could easily start going over 10 total fires. But keeping, the tra keeping track of the amount of fires on your bottleneck rifle cartridges is super, super important. So I highly advise doing that. Now, also I have what's called a bad brass bin here. And Obviously, once you've exhausted the life of that brass, you're gonna to want to recycle it. And once brass goes into this bad brass bin, it never comes out. So being that I'm reloading 100 total pieces of Lake City brass, I can grab two of my EP integrations locked on reloading blocks, which is really nice about these. They're fully adjustable, just under 223 and just over 375 shy tack and they adjust in less than a second. And I'm doing this obviously to count out my 100 pieces. And I'm also going to call out these bad pieces that I purchased from a gentleman off of Facebook. Now, some of these have a dented case mouth opening, for example, like this piece here. Usually rule of thumb is, is if it, that dent in the case mouth opening is a quarter of the case mouth opening or less. I'm usually fine with that. They'll get knocked out during the resizing process. And also keeping an eye out for massive dents in the side of the case body. If there's a little bit of a dent in there, I can live with that. That'll pop out once that casing is fired in the chamber. But if it's an excessive dent or if it's something that you're questioning, cheap insurance is just to throw it away. So a little bit of a dent's fine, a massive dent, maybe just throw it away and move on to the next piece. Quarter of the case mouth opening or less, usually you find they'll get knocked out during the resizing process. So I'm gonna call out 100 total pieces of this Lake City brass. Now, I called out some really bad examples here just to show you for those guys that are absolutely new would not be acceptable for really damaged case mouth openings. You can see how excessively dirty this Lake City brass is, but that's something I'm just not gonna be able to pop out in regards to the case mouth opening. So I'm definitely gonna throw that away. But to give you an example of what I can pop out, this is something that I would consider be accept acceptable in regards to popping out that case mouth opening. 
So that'd be totally fine. In regards to dents in the case body, you know, something like this would be pretty excessive. I would probably just throw that away. Definitely cheap insurance, something not to risk your life on. But in regards to small dents in the case body that will usually pop out in regards to being fire formed, these would be totally acceptable. And I actually think I'm gonna pull out a few extra just for safe measure. Now, one quick note in regards to the range pick brass, especially for those guys that are absolutely new and just getting into reloading, is the holy grail of brass that you picked off the ground at the range is once fired. But you're truly never gonna really know how many fires are on that brass. A good sign or indication that that brass might be truly only once fired, someone that went, for example, to Cabela's, brought some factory ammunition, fired it once and let it lay on the ground and you picked it up, is primer sealer. If you ever see something like this, not saying guys that reload can't seal their primers, but it's pretty rare. It's a good indication that someone went and bought some brand new factory ammunition, fired it and let it lay on the ground. Matter of fact, you could see numerous pieces in here that have red primer sealer. That gives me a good idea that this is once fired, but once again, I'll truly never know how many firings are on this brass. When it comes to reloading range pick brass, you gotta be careful. I very well could have reloaded this 10 times and I knew it was on its last leg and I let it lay on the ground and you came by the next day and picked it up. And reloading that brass can be somewhat dangerous, especially when the walls of the casings can get really thin in regards to case head separation where the head of the casing literally separates from the body, case head separation. And you gotta be very careful when it comes to that. So. Make sure you do your research in regards to case head separation. It's very, very important, especially when you're picking brass that you did not fire off the ground. Now, when it comes to military grade ammunition like this Lake City brass, a matter of fact, you can see this on some factory ammunition. This has a crimped primer where the primer has literally been crimped into the primer pocket itself. Matter of fact, you can see this distinct ring perimeter around the primer pocket itself of this Lake City brass. And they do this more times with military grade ammunition when that person's uh, life is on the line, they wanna make sure that that primer doesn't blow out of the casing. Um, but you will, you can see this uh, in factory ammunition. It's very important to keep an eye out for that telltale sign of the crimped primer pocket. So when you we pop out this old primer, we need to remove this crimp in order to see in the new primer. Now on the left here with the Starline 6.5 Creamore brass, you can see there's no distinctive ring around the primer pocket opening itself. So this is a good example of no crimp on the primer pocket opening. And this is a good example with crimp. It's something that's very important. You need to keep an eye out for this if you want this to go smooth in regards to inserting a new primer. If the brass you're about to reload has a spent primer, your first step in the reloading process should always be decapping out that spent primer. I personally like to use the FW Arms decapper. It's auto centering. I've tried them all in regards to like a lead decapping die and other brands. What's nice about the FW Arms decapper is it's auto centering with this collar. If this happens to be off ever so slightly. This will auto center it to make sure that this pin doesn't get bent and damaged. So if you're just about to buy your equipment, another quick no is don't ever buy a kit. Buy the best equipment that you can afford. And right out of the gate, I highly suggest getting the FW Arms decapper. It's just an amazing decapper that works on the smallest of casings up to the largest casings and doesn't damage the pin over a period of use, especially if it's a progressive press. But you should always decap out that spent primer for two reasons. One is to expose the primer pocket so it can get cleaned right away, especially if you're using something like a wet stainless steel tumbler. And two is cratered primers. If you have cratered primers, you're gonna get mismeasurements. For example, if you're measuring your head space, um, you just wanna get those out right out of the gate as your first step of the reloading process. And that gives you a better idea of that crimped opening of the primer pocket itself. Let's get the rest of these decapped. And 
And that's literally all we did is just remove the spent primer. So the next step is to clean this ultra dirty brass. I personally like to use a wet stainless steel tumbler, like this Frankfurt Arsenal tumbler. It works amazing, especially for big bulk uh, reloading sessions like this. Now, when it comes to the stainless steel media itself, don't make the mistake that I did when I first started out by using pins. These pins are notorious for getting stuck in the case mouth openings of six millimeter and 6.5 millimeter bullet flavors. Just bypass the pins completely. And personally, I like to use Southern Shine stainless steel media. It's more like a shape like a stainless steel shaving rather than a pin they just don't get stuck in the case mouth openings like pins do um like i said i like to use the frankfurt arsenal uh wet tumbler here what i personally like to do is first and foremost i went and epoxied in a magnet at the bottom of my sink just to make sure if any pins get by that they don't go down my drain I like to get the hottest water possible, always clean with hot water. So we get the hottest water possible until you start to see the steam rise. All right, so I'm getting some really good hot water out of there. I can see that steam rising. So I'm gonna take my cap off here. I actually made this funnel mod here for the Frankfurt Arsenal um, tumbler here. I'm just gonna dump in my brass. And I have about a pound and a half of this Southern Shine stainless steel media in there. So I'm gonna put a good squirt of Dawn, use Dawn only, don't use any other substitute, there really is none. Uh, just put a nice squirt in there, you don't have to go overboard, um, but something like that. Uh, when it gets to being really excessive, dirty brass, something like this Lake City brass, you can either use Lemmy Shine. I personally like to buy this uh, mallard citric acid off of Amazon. Big bulk package of it like this lasts forever. Um, something just like a, literally like a teaspoon. It doesn't take much of that. You don't want to use too much. Otherwise your brass will turn pink. <laughs> and uh, just fill this up, get a nice suds going here. And I'll usually fill this up damn near to the point where it's full just short of the cap. So when I put the cap on, that the suds don't overfill. Put my cap back on. And usually something like this, that's really dirty, Lake City brass. I usually clean this for about an hour and a half. All right, so this had a solid chance for about an hour and a half to clean. And all I use is a popcorn bowl and a strainer here. Dump everything in to the strainer. Pretty darn clean after an hour and a half. Looks pretty good. Next, we'll get this on the Leiden Cyclone case dryer. And we'll just set this at the maximum three hours. Set it and forget it. Thank you. 